with Lee Moses. He was born in Belfont, Pennsylvania, and is married to the former Kelly Jo Goodman. They have two five-year-old sons, Luke Garland and Fabius Lee, and an infant daughter. Is that pronounced Lana Ruth? Lana? Lana Ruth May. Lee was baptized into Christ by Gary Summers in 1999 in Denton, Texas. He graduated from the University of North Texas in 1998 with a Bachelor of Music degree in music education from the Memphis School of Preaching in 2002. He also attended Berkeley College of Music from Boston, Massachusetts. He's done graduate work at Southern Christian University, now Regions, now Ambridge. So, in Montgomery, Alabama, Lee currently serves as preacher with the Church of Christ in Mammoth Spring, Arkansas, and is the editor of the Fulton County Gospel News. And there are a number of those out there that we furnish to those who would like to get them. It's a very good paper, a lot of very good articles. And we appreciate his work, his ability to preach the gospel. And it's just very encouraging to me, especially if you could talk with him and learn of his conversion, and to know that there must be other young folks out there like him. I would appreciate if you take a minute or two and just tell a little bit about how you became a member of the church. I think it would be encouraging, not in the sense of giving denominational testimony, but just simply show the power of the word and the person, no matter where you come from, that they will let Jesus have his way with them through the gospel. If you'd do that just for a moment, I, I think it's encouraging to all of us to recognize the power of the word of God in the lives of men, women, boys, and girls when they'll honestly approach it and be willing to receive it. He's going to preach this evening on love, the authority of God's word, and unity. So we ask Brother Moses to come speak to us. Well, it is a pleasure to be here for this lectureship. By request, uh, I guess I'll mention a few words about uh, my conversion. Uh, I came from a Presbyterian background, but it's actually interesting that it's back here because it was just down the road where I first set foot in a Church of Christ or a Church of Christ building. And I was out with a friend of the family helping her. Uh, she was the local precinct chairman for the Republican Party. And uh, she kind of snuck me in there. I didn't know where I was going. And I just followed her in the door, and there happened to be a worship service taking place. Uh, but I heard something distinctive uh, that night that I'd never heard before. Uh, growing up in a denomination where you're not really ever told there's anything that you need to do. In one sentence, I don't remember what the sermon was about, but one sentence that I heard uh, really struck a chord. And that sentence was, the purpose of your time here on earth is to do what is necessary to go to heaven. That certainly resonated with me as I would always been taught there's really nothing you need to do or can do. And so it wasn't too long before I found my way to the Pearl Street Congregation in Denton. I found brethren such as uh, Gary and Barb Summers, who I'm honored to be here with this evening around, and on this lectureship. And as well, Brother Doug McClish, who further encouraged me to go on and begin uh, preaching the Word. We read in Psalm 133.1, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. We can go down the road not too far and find some congregations with whom we would not say that we can have unity, but ask them, would you like unity? They would say yes. Turn it back around. Go up toward Richland Hills. Would you like unity? Yes, we would very much like unity. Go to Abilene. Go to Memphis. Go to brethren throughout the country and throughout the world and ask the question, would you like to have unity? And then come back here and ask every brother and sister here this evening, would you like unity? To guess, we all answer, yes, we would like unity. So we're here all agreed on this point. We all desire something here. We all desire unity. And to desire unity is good, noble, and right. 
And so we all have a certain singularity of desire, but yet we do not have unity. Why is that? You see, unity does not magically happen because brethren desire unity. I'm very appreciative for this lectureship that is taking place on the subject of unity. As the elders here, as Brother David Brown, as the congregation here has come together and brought these speakers together to consider what the Bible has to say about unity. Because that's where we're going to have to look if we want to have unity. As we think about what the Bible has to say, we learn certainly that love plays a crucial role toward attaining and maintaining unity. And equally important is the authority of God's Word. Unfortunately, because of the failure of far too many, certainly we see it among the sex, but as well of our own brethren, to understand true biblical love, to understand the authority of God's Word, this has led to ruptures and gaping gulfs of unity. But all of those gulfs could swiftly be closed. We could have what we all want, which is unity if people would truly consider, understand, and embrace the biblical teachings of love, the authority of God's Word, and the unity of the church. This evening, I'd first like to consider the love that reigns supreme. In 1 Corinthians 14, we have a commandment that is given there. We read in verse 1, follow after charity. We are to pursue it. We are to diligently seek that charity, that is love. Right before that, the verse immediately we proceed, we read, And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. The greatest of these is love. Greater than that faith which procures our salvation. Greater than that hope which enables us to live on this earth despite we are not the fact that we are not yet attained our home. Charity or love is the greatest of these three. But you see, not any love is the greatest. Not just any love reigns supreme. The word love in the modern English language is somewhat of an enigma. When somebody says love, well, what does that mean? Does that mean the nurture a mother has toward her children? Does that mean the racing heartbeat a young man has when in the presence of a certain young lady? Does that mean the watering mouth a hungry man might have when a juicy steak is set before him? What does that mean? It's been said you can ask a hundred different people for a definition of love, and the chances are you will get 90 different answers. What someone means when he says to us, love, while that may not always be clear to us in the English, the Greek language is much more precise with regard to this word than the English or even than the Hebrew. It describes the different loves with at least four different words, each having a different shade of meaning. We think about how it was said that the Lord came in the fullness of the times, Galatians 4.4. Perhaps a portion of this fullness of time came with a way that would des describe this love as Christianity would be characterized by love more than any other mark. Perhaps the Lord desired terms that would distinctly define the love that we are to have. Well, there are four major different types of love in New Testament Greek. One being eros. And this speaks about a passionate love usually uh, self-willed, self-seeking. Matter of fact, it's the word from which we get erotic, hence it often means sexual lust. And it's worth noting that this unthinking, this self-seeking love is nowhere commended in the Bible. There's also storge, which is family love. The love a mother would have to her children. We don't find this being a commandment of not necessarily. We don't find this being a particularly Christian characteristic. But we do find in Romans 1, 30, uh, 1, 18 and following, we find the absence of it as being a mark of utter depravity. There is philos, 
which is speaking about simply a very general word for a favorable dis disposition or affection toward anything. And sometimes that favorable disposi uh, disposition can become very unfavorable. As you find people having a philos toward money, a philos toward self, but then the fourth of these is agape. And this is a very distinctively Christian love. You look outside of the Bible. You look outside of early Christian writings. And that word agape is virtually absent from other writings. But look at the New Testament. You find this word saturating the pages. That and its verb cognate is saturating the pages of the New Testament. And this love is different than the others. While ergos is a, an impulsive love taking its own fulfillment from others, agape, on the other hand, is a decisive love, giving in behalf of it the object of its love. While storge exists between family members, agape can exist between persons of all different classes. While other loves emphasize the emotions the one loving has for the object of its love, Agape emphasizes action. And so this being the distinctively Christian love, that tells us a little bit something about the love that we are to have. But as we are seeking for that true love, follow after charity, we need to remember where we need to look. In 1 John 4, 7 and 8, we read of the source of love. Love is of God. And verse 8 tells us that God is love. God is the source of love and God is the epitome. God is the personification of love. We need to look toward him if we were to find this true love. And God demonstrates various things about love. God demonstrates that true love is unconditional. We read in 1 John 3.16, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. He laid down his life. What kind of great love is that? Greater love has no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends, is what Christ says. But it goes beyond that. In Romans 5, 7, we read, For peradventure for a righteous, or a, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we had set ourselves completely against him, Christ died for us. He gave his son for us. And we are to look toward that love for the type of love that we're to have. Christ said, ye have heard that it hath been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. Matthew 5, 43. It goes on to say, But I say unto you, Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For it maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans the same? And if you salute them which salute you, what do you more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. You see, he has that unconditional love. That does not mean that it is unconditional in its response. But let's go on and consider that God demonstrates that true love is not emotionally based. Well, think about what we just said, that while we are yet sinners, while we are yet at enmity with God, Christ died for us. He wasn't going off his emotions on that time. It is to mankind's benefit that God's love is not emotionally based. Otherwise, mankind has been eradicated from off the earth many millennia ago. Now, when we say that that love is not emotionally based, this does not mean that one who holds biblical love will not hold any emotional attachment whatsoever to the object of his love. If one is truly seeking the best interests of another, he will rejoice 
when those interests are realized, and he will grieve when those interests are not. God grieved over the sins of the world. He was furious with them. It repented the Lord that he made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart, Genesis 6.6. 6. And likewise, Christians grieve when fellow Christians grieve because of their empathetic love toward them. Romans 12, 15, Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. 1 Corinthians 12, 26, And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. However, biblical agape is not emotionally based. That is not the basis of that love. One cannot let emotional, personal interests keep one from doing what is the best interest of others. Doing what is best for them. If the Lord's commanded to love your enemies, demanded an emotional affection, perhaps no one will be able to fulfill it. However, he told us how to love our enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That's how we do it. You see, we're told that we are not to have that emotional attachment to base our love upon, although there might be an emotional involvement with it. But this brings us to the next point, as God tells us how we are to love our enemies. You see, God demonstrates that true love is active. It's based upon what we do, and with God it's based upon what He does. Notice the refrain that we've been saying. God demonstrates what love is. God shows what love is. His love is manifested in action. 1 John 3, 1, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Behold, it's something observable. Hereby perceive we the love of God. Verse 16. It's something that we can see because of what he has done. We think about the argument that James makes in chapter 2 of his Proverbs of the New Testament, so to speak. But in verse 18 he is speaking about the fact that you need to show me your faith. He said, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. We could likewise replace love with that. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast love, and I have works. Show me thy love without thy works, and I will show thee my love by my works. It's been well said, love shown is love known. There's no more noble attribute of man than his capacity to love. No beast of the field, no fowl of the air, no fish of the sea has the capacity to love. Only man created in the image of loving God has the ability to love. And we cannot neglect that mandate to love. 1 Peter 4, 8, And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. When one has biblical agape, he has the love that reigns supreme. Well, let's consider next the love that bows in subjection. While love is the crowning Christian attribute, love must yet submit itself to the authority of God's Word. There are far too many professing Christians who fail to realize this. They think that the attaining and maintaining of love as they define it is so important that all else can be altered or even set aside to assure the preservation of this so-called love. However, while love reigns supreme, it cannot negate the necessary. And submission to the authority of God's Word is necessary, and true love willingly bows in subjection before that authority. And as the church respects the need for Christ's authority from His Word, and manifest true biblical love. Well, let's ask, is there a problem with God's authority? Well, obviously the problem is not with God's authority. For of Him and through Him and to Him are all things, to whom be glory forever and ever. 
Amen. Romans 11, 36. God has the power. God has the authority. He has vested and placed it in His Word as it's given through Christ. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by Him. Colossians 3, 17. There's no doubt that that authority is complete. And the problem is not with that authority. The problem is with how man perceives and responds to the authority of God's Word. By illustration, there was a maestro who was at an or orchestra rehearsal, and they're coming close to the concert time, and he kind of raps on the podium with the baton. He says, okay, we're going to make some changes to our score, so please get out your pencils, he says to the musicians. So, so he goes and he says, change the first two measures from 4-4 four, four time to 3-4. And then in the fifth measure, change it to 7-8 time and do that all the way until the end. Now in the following measure, I want you to lower the pitch one half step. And then in the 13th measure, go down another whole step and carry that through all the way until the end. Well, I'll say, thank you. Now, let us begin. At this point, the soprano soloist interjects, excuse me, maestro, uh, what would you like for me to change? And the conductor replied, nothing, madame. Saying it just exactly as you did yesterday. You see, sometimes people think that they need to change the standard to, so, to fit the alterations that man puts upon the standard. Because mankind fails to meet the standards that have been set before, we need to make alterations. So just as that conductor felt that he had to have that score conform to that faulty soprano soloist, so many times people take God's word and try to change that to conform to mankind's shortcomings. Now to an extent, all mankind has a problem with God's standard. That is all vary from that standard occasionally. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We sometimes miss that mark. We don't land squarely where we need to. But when we vary from God's standard, we're then left with two choices. We can either alter one's actions to meet the standard, or he can try to alter the standard and expect everyone else to meet this new flawed standard as in the illustration that we just gave. But of these two choices, there's really no choice. The standard cannot change. Breaking the scale won't fix your weight problem. Breaking the mirror will not change the way you look. And changing or ignoring God's work will not make our sinful behavior acceptable. And finally, we consider along this line, does love trump authority? Some believe that because of the greatest of all these is love, that love should serve as a sort of trump card. Now, I was speaking with one brother, and it wasn't too long after this uh, situation that's currently taking place in the brotherhood regarding David Miller. Before, it wasn't too long after it completely exploded. I was speaking with him about the situation, and he told me how he was judging the situation. He said he was applying a test of love to anything he heard anyone say. Whatever he read, whatever he heard, he would look at what they said and compare it to the attributes of love found in 1 Corinthians 13. Now, on the face of that, that's, this sounds perhaps like a good test. We think about those attributes, we find them. Love suffers long and is kind. Love envieth not. Love vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, does not behave itself unseemly, seeks not its own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. You have some noble characteristics that we should seek to conform our thoughts and our practices to at all times. Indeed, anything anyone does without this love is worthless, verses 1 through 3 of 1 Corinthians 13. But however, as I talked with this brother first, I found that his test was extremely flawed. 
it was obvious that certain attributes of love were receiving far greater weight than others. He was placing a lot of emphasis upon is kind and thinketh no evil. While attributes such as rejoiceth not in iniquity and rejoicing in the truth were apparently receiving no weight at all. And also because of his uneven weight, he was failing to understand that when love is kind, it's going to respond differently based upon the circumstances. How is love going to respond when there is evil? We're told that love thinketh no evil. Does that mean it doesn't even realize that evil exists? Through thy precept I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Psalm 119, 104. Psalm 119, 128. Therefore I seem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right, and I hate every false way. And that is love too. That is part of how love responds, is to hate certain things. Love must respond differently when iniquity is involved. You see, because that love must bow down before the authority of God's Word. Well, let's briefly consider some love that falls flat on its face. Love is such a noble Christian attribute, and it's very unfortunate what so many ideas and perversions of the world that have drifted into the Lord's church have done with this noble attribute. One of these perversions of love is the idea that love equals permissiveness and not hurting others. There was a discussion that took place in the, within the letters to the editor section of a Tennessee paper several years ago, and they were talking about spanking and whether parents ought to or ought not to spank their children. And one mother wrote, anybody who spanks their children is either mean and unloving or ignorant. But is that really the unloving thing to do? Think about what we see merely from the fruits of parents who fail properly to discipline their children. We see a lot of children who are running wild. And then we have teenagers who are running wild. We have adults that are running wild with no respect whatsoever for any type of authority. In Proverbs 13, 24, the wisdom of Solomon compelled him to write, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. Gets on him early with that. Disciplines him effectively and firmly and quickly. That's the loving thing to do. And it's unfortunate that people try to pervert the parental responsibility to bring up a child and discipline that child properly. But it's even worse that people try to extend such faulty concepts of love and try to bring that over to God. And say that God has to be permissive. God cannot ever have any idea of hurting anybody in any way. But we read in Proverbs 3.12, For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth. Or as the American Standard Version says, he reproveth. As the, it goes on Hebrew, it would say chasteneth. Even as the father, the son in whom he delighted. Just as a father who loves that child, who wants to do everything to discipline him, to show him the right way. The Father who loves us will want to discipline us to show us the right way. There are hardships that we might have to face, but we can sometimes count those things all joy, James 1 and verse 2, if we look at those things properly and realize that we have a loving God and a God who will ultimately punish eternally because He must and because He is just. And then it not only comes from there, on this idea of permissiveness, but it goes from God then from how brethren need to act toward brethren. See, brethren, you cannot reprove somebody else. You cannot correct somebody. You cannot do anything to hurt anybody's feelings. We're reading Proverbs 27.5. Open rebuke is better than secret love. Really, the idea is being there that secret love is not really any kind of love at all. If you're a friend, you're going to reprove him when it's necessary. In Leviticus 19, as we read in there of 
one of the great statements about love, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, in verse 18. The prior verse, just the verse just prior to that, says, Thou shalt not hate thy neighbor in thy heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. If you love your neighbor, you're going to rebuke him when it's necessary. And how much is that so of brethren? Love does not equal permissiveness. Love does not equal hurting others. Well, there's other things we could talk about. We could talk about how love equals, the idea that love equals love. Uh, but there's a different uh, perversions of love that we could think about. Uh, but let's go on and let's consider the idea that there's love that works hand in hand. There's a love that reigns supreme. There's a love that bows in a uh, bows subjection. There's a love that falls flat in its face, and there's a love that works hand in hand. Again, unity is not something that's magically going to happen because brethren desire. Brethren must strive diligently for unity. Ephesians 4:3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace, or as the American Standard says, giving diligence to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. It's something that we need to make efforts to attain. And there are certain elements that must be present for there to be unity. There must be a bond for unity to prevail. We sometimes sing the song, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. And what a beautiful song that is of unity. But some brethren apparently want unity without any tie to bind there. There's no, nothing bonding us together, simply that desire for unity, but that's not going to do it. We need something secure. We need secure adhesives to bring us together. And the Bible describes love as glue. In Colossians 3, as it speaks about a number of the attributes that Christians must put off and a turn of attributes that Christians must put on. But read it above all these things. Put on charity or love, which is the bond of perfectness, verse 14. That is, it is a glue. It is that bond that brings us together and makes us complete. Peter lists it as well as the final of the Christian graces. And just as it crowns those previous graces, it combines and accumulates those previous Grace. Again, without love, all else is futile. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and I have not shared, I may become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have the gift of faith so that I can remove mountains, and have not shared, I am nothing. And though I, it goes on to speak about even if I give my body, to, if I give my body to burn, give all my possessions to feed the poor, and have not charity, have not love, it profiteth me nothing. We must have that love, or all is futile. As obedience and faith re require each other to render the other effectual, everything requires love to render it effectual. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision but faith which worketh by love, Galatians 5, 6. We're going to need that love to perfect that faith. We're going to need that love to perfect our works or else they are few. And true, a non-hypocritical love will stick. In Romans 12, 9, we're told, let love be without hypocrisy. You cannot have a hypocritical love, but it goes on to say, cleave to that which is good. Stick to that which is good. True non-hypocritical love will stick to, or cleave, stick like glue to that which is good. But however, while genuine non-hypocritical love will stick to that which is good, it also serves as a repent to that which is evil. Abhor that which is evil. A lack of love has torn asunder the unity of the Lord's church in far too many places. Those who profess to love the Lord really don't show a love to the Lord because they fail to submit to his authority. 
Sometimes they seek their own self-interest. They seek to be loyal to a certain segment of the brotherhood. They show respect to persons of fail to show true biblical love. They serve their own self-interest. But we must love the Lord, and we must love the brethren in the way that the Bible says to. That includes to rebuke and remove ourselves from them when it is necessary. In 1 John 4, 20, we read, If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother. And remember what we read in Leviticus 17, or Leviticus 19, verse 17. That if we fail to rebuke our brother, we're showing hatred to him sometimes. But again, if a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth his brother, whom he ha hath seen, for he that loveth, loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? How can that be? How can that be? Jesus said, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one toward another. John 13 and verse 15. Now in many communities, people have seen the way members of the local church, Church of Christ, have treated one another, and they see no evidence that they are followers of Christ. And likewise, people need to be seeing what their Bible says. If they're not showing that biblical type of love, that includes rebuke. Indeed, they will not see the, the disciples of Christ there either. As the Hebrews writer urged, let brotherly love continue. Love is glue for that unity. But also the authority of God's word is glue for unity as well. Different people might have some type of affection for each other. They might profess to have a very deep love for one another. But there will never be unity in the church without a common standard and without adherence to the common standard. We know we've got the standards so let's abide by it. Nevertheless, where to we have already attained. Let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Philippians 3, 7, 3, 16. As we are to be endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, we're told then about those pillars of unity. There is one body and one spirit, even as you're called and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Ephesians 4, verses 4 through 6. We need to realize that there is, there is oneness in all of those things. There must be doctrinal unity. And as the church looks to the authority of God's Word and conforms to it, there we will all speak the same thing. There will be no divisions among us, but we will be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. 1 Corinthians 1.10 If unity is to prevail in the Lord's church, true biblical love must be accompanied by respect for the authority of God's Word. And those who belittle the authority of God's Word, either directly or maybe indirectly by their conduct, those who belittle the authority of God's Word not only loose the bonds that restrain our conduct, but they also loosen the bonds that hold precious Christian souls in unity. That's taken away from us. Biblical love and the respect for the authority of God's Word must overcome their adversaries. And if they have their adversaries right now, brethren. But if we do that, unity will prevail. Almost all, if not all, brethren, at least express a desire for unity. But for far too many, either their desire for unity is not strong enough to do what is necessary to obtain it or maintain it, or else they simply fail to understand what true unity is all about and what is necessary to obtain it and maintain it. Even in the Lord's church, 
There are many who wrongly define love, and even among those who define it correctly, they fail to apply it the way the Bible teaches. God's love prompted him to give us an authoritative standard. We've not been left to our own devices. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death, and God doesn't want us to go that way. His love prompted us to lead us by an authoritative stance. And if we love him, we will wholeheartedly comply with every term of the stance. We will not look for loopholes. We will not make exceptions. If ye love me, keep my commandments, John 14 and verse 15. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. 1 John 5 and verse 3. And among all who do this, there will be unity. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity.